What makes a photograph interesting? Is this an interesting photograph? I don't find it very interesting. It's just a couple of kids playing on the screen. Right. It's what? Not very good composure. Not very good composure. So it's not a well composed scene. If it's interesting, it would be interesting to the father who took this picture. And it happened to be me. So this presents a problem. How do we make this picture interesting? And I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it. I just wanted to make a record. So we like it because it's our family. You don't find it particularly interesting because you don't know who these people are. What this is, it's a photograph that's of personal interest to uh, my wife and I and maybe my kids. It's not the kind of photograph you want to put up in a gallery that you even put on a JPEG uh, or a photo sharing site because it doesn't have a broad enough interest for enough different people. Okay, some photographs have emotional content. So in this case, most people would look at this and have some kind of an emotional reaction. They might say, who's that bum over there? How come the police don't haul her off? Or they might say, what kind of a society do we live in that people sleep and beg on the streets? But most people would have some kind of a reaction to this. So there's often emotional content in pictures that draws us in and makes them interesting to us. Photographs can also have documentary content. This is a famous picture by Dorothea Lange called Migrant Mother, taken in 1936 for the Farm Security Administration. The photographic section of the Farm Security Administration was supposed to go out and document the Great Depression and make people aware of the problems of people like the migrant mother here. A lot of people from Oklahoma whose uh, fields dried up and blew away in the dust storms went out to California to uh, find a better living or to be able to provide for their families and ended up being um, migrant workers, paid uh, very little, maybe 10 cents a day. So this photograph was intended to document that plight. Do you think it has emotional content too? Yeah, you have an emotional reaction to it, yeah. So it's not that that it either has emotional content or documentary content or it's a personal interest. It can be all those things. And some pictures are interesting because they document locations that are exotic or that we've heard about and seen pictures of and we think we'd like to go visit. So here's a picture of a canal in Venice. And some pictures are interesting because they tell a story. They have narrative content. So there's something going on here and if we look at this photograph we're bound to start making some assumptions like, what do we assume about these people? They're tourists. Are they together? Possible. How, how is this guy getting around? He has a bicycle. We only see one bicycle, so maybe, maybe she doesn't have a bicycle. Maybe she's not with him. Maybe he's just asking her for directions. Or maybe they are together, and maybe they've just seen the Trevi Fountain, which is in the background here, and they're planning how to get to their next destination. Okay, but there's some kind of a story going on here, and when we see some action like this, we're tempted to explain what's going on. We're tempted to write or compose some kind of a story about it. Now, the problem with relying on subject matter, and in each case we're talking about personal interest subject matter, documentary subject matter, narrative subject matter, emotional subject matter. The problem with relying on subject matter for uh, your photographs is that you can make an uninteresting photograph about an interesting subject. Here's a modest effort. This is a picture of the uh, Neptune fountain in Rome. And here's another one. 
hopefully you find this second one more interesting. Why? It's better composed. It's moved in, it's, it has a central focus. Uh, it's focused in on the, um, the horse, for one thing, in the fountain. Then we get to see the pigeons landing everywhere. This one, we see some pigeons, we even see a seagull up there, but there's a lot of negative space or space that doesn't have any kind of, it doesn't have much detail that contributes to the meaning of the picture. So negative space isn't necessarily a bad thing, but in this case, if there's no uh, detail in the picture that really contributes to what the picture is trying to accomplish, what it's trying to say, yeah, it becomes distracting. It's just a big space that's kind of boring. And here, the space is all used pretty well. There seems to be something going on most everywhere in the space. You can also make an interesting photograph about something that's seemingly uninteresting. So here's a Walmart bag in water. And here's a Walmart bag in water. It's one of those blue happy face Walmart bags that they don't make anymore. But the happy face got kind of sinister as it was twisted in the water. Okay, then a picture in addition to subject matter can have conceptual content. And that can make a photograph interesting. This is a photograph taken by Tom Barrow and it's from his cancellation series. What Barrow did was he took a series of pictures like this that weren't very interesting in and of themselves and he put X's across the negatives like this and printed them and called them his cancellation series. Anybody know what a cancellation mark is for? On an etching or a lithograph? When you uh, make an etching you take a metal plate and you scratch your picture into it and then you can print that onto paper. You ink that and print it. And uh, when you get all through, let's say you make an addition of 50 prints. When you get all through, you put a big X across it. You scratch it. Why would you do that? Yeah, so no more copies can be made from it. Um, and the reason for that is that the value of a print is dependent on how many of those prints you make and of course whether anybody wants to buy the print in the first place. But if it were a print by Picasso and he made a thousand of them, they wouldn't be worth as much as if he only made a hundred or if he only made fifty. So the fewer prints you make, the more they're worth. And so you cancel out the plate. I might just mention that um, there was a movement in art called conceptual art. and what the people were trying to say was we're not going to focus on subject matter anymore. We're going to um, make art that uh, concentrates on an idea. There was a fellow that blew up balloons and sold them as artist's breath. He said, I'm an artist, therefore anything I make is art. So is a balloon full of air interesting in itself? No. You, if you buy one, you buy it because this man is a recognized conceptual artist and it's worth something for that reason. The whole idea of uh, conceptual art is that it's not the artwork itself, it's the concept behind the artwork that makes it interesting or makes it valuable. A photograph like this can have a concept behind it. For example, are the people in the background real? Is the man real? Is he? Can you talk to him and shake hands with him? No, it's a picture of a man that was real. And these are actually, this is a picture of people that were real at the time that Renoir painted them at the uh, Moulin de, de la Galate. So we really have kind of two levels of reality here, but when you think about it, he's not real either. He's just it's a picture of someone that is probably real. Does that make sense? 
And this is an issue that was brought up with regard to photography. People thought that seeing was believing, and people, as we got into the 60s and 70s and 80s, people began to question that whole idea of what's real in a photograph. And what Tom Barrow was trying to do with his cancellation series was to call attention to the surface of the photograph. So he was saying, this is not reality, it's not a representation of reality, it's a piece of paper with an emulsion on it and that we can make dark places and light places and I'm going to put an X across that to emphasize that surface. Does that make sense? So that was the concept behind what he was trying to do. Now the problem with relying on concept is that you have to know what the person is doing. If you just see a conceptual piece and you don't have any idea of what the person is doing, you may not understand it and you may not like it. So you have to have some prior knowledge. You have to be in the know. Now some photographs are interesting even though they lack identifiable subject matter or concept. So this may or may not be interesting to you. How many people find this interesting? If you do find this interesting, it's not because it's a picture of somebody in your family. It's not a picture of an important event. It's not a picture of an interesting place. It's interesting because of the color and the line and the shapes. So it's interesting for formal reasons. An abstract photograph is one that is of interest for its formal qualities rather than for its subject matter. And for our purposes, we're going to say that form pretty much means composition. And composition is how the elements of art are arranged within the frame according to the principles of art. Now there was a period in the uh, 70s, 80s, 90s when art schools, a lot of people stopped teaching, the, um, stopped teaching composition and the elements of art and the principles of art and they said it's irrelevant. First of all because so much of art was conceptually based so what do we need to worry about how things are arranged on the canvas or in the um, frame of the <coughs> photograph. I think composition is important and it's making a comeback. We see uh, people doing representational art again, um, paying more attention to how the picture looks and not putting so much emphasis on the idea behind the picture. 